Thus, their thinking has changed. And they have gone on to disbelieve what God says and to go on to believe what a serpent says. And they have accepted sin. Sin didn't lose its deadly nature because they accepted it. It just tore down and moved past barriers of violation in their mind and in their heart. And because of this, they accepted it. When it moved past those barriers of violation in their minds and in their hearts, it brought death along with it. Death is imminent for the person that willfully goes on in sin. They don't realize, they have themselves deluded as to what sin would do to them because they want to believe what they want to believe. It wasn't because they were tempted. It wasn't because they talked to us. But it was because a change took place in their thinking. A change took place in their thinking. And this is what happens when one willfully goes on into sin. Their thinking has changed. Sin has become tolerable. I will invite sin into my home. I will partake in the sin because to me, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that bad of a thing. I'm not going to die from it. They're just a bunch of old rules that people go and set for people. And because they tolerate it, it goes undealt with. And because of the changed view of sin, then death comes with it. Just because of the world's view of sin changed, doesn't make sin acceptable. Sin is sin no matter how justified one is doing it. No matter how right it feels. No matter who's doing it. And just because culture and just because time as an angel. 
change your life. But if you go and you think that that word transformed, that, that word transformed goes to let us know that he's skimming and that he's pondering and that he's thinking of ways to get inside of your mind, to get inside of your heart, to ease up on sin, Sherry. Sin ain't wrong. Sin ain't bad. You ain't going to die if you do it. You ain't going to die if you don't repent from it. Because we were born into sin and we were shaken in iniquity and we were brought into this world with this mindset that if naturally we go on and we let one go, they will continue on in sin. Therefore, it must be that men everywhere must repent. The writer told us, be sober. He's not just talking about sobriety. Don't go smoke herb and don't drink alcohol. He's talking about that too. Don't stay. Okay? Not one of them hippies. But he's saying be sober. Don't become intoxicated with sin. Don't become intoxicated with, with, with anger, with bitterness, and with gossiping, and, and with strife, and, and all of these other things that go and lead men into sin. But be vigilant. Keep your eyes open. Be aware. We know what he's coming. We know what he's doing. But because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walking, walketh about seeking. He's talking about seeking. Who's our own? That word seeking, in other words, just goes to let us know. He's, he's pondering. What can I do to get them to live? What can I do to, to, to trip up Roger? On the ride home, Roger, what can I do to get you to fight with your wife? Sister Riser, what can I get you to do to get to looking at sister so-and-so with jealousy? How can I get into your mind? How can I get into your spirit to make you come and to make you build the children of God with, 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 with bitterness and with hatred and with envy? That is the works of the devil, and Jesus Christ came to destroy that. Or do you stay down? 
And isn't it normal that when you have begun to hear, let's say, I don't know, somebody pick a place for me. Jason, pick a place for me that you'd like to go outside of church. Applebee's. Let's say you're in a portion of the town, you don't know where Apple's, Applebee's is. Okay? Let's say you're in a portion of the town, you don't know where Applebee's is. And so you go because you think you know where it's at, and you find out that you lost. What are you ever doing? Google it. And then you go the right way. Okay? Why then is this people of Jerusalem slid back in the perpetual backslide? And then he goes and he gives an answer. They hold fast the seat. And they refuse to return. Why do these people's minds continue on in backsliding? It's because their minds and because their hearts are not renewed. And there is a refusal to let go as they hold on to the seduction of sin. Transgression, it speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. It tells me it's embedded on the inside. There is no fear or no dread of God before their eyes. For he flatters himself and deceives himself in his own eyes that his iniquity shall not be found out and be hated. Because that they willfully go on and choose to believe a lie and choose to go on to sin and refuse to be changed. They cleave unto the mindset that is skewed. That's why God said, I will choose their delusions. He said, you know what? I'm not going to strive with you. I'm not going to put up a stink with you. I'll come and I'll extend my mercy to get you to repent. But it's if you refuse to repent, then I will choose your delusions. That's why it told us in Proverbs, because they go on and they choose to do their own things, then they reject my advice and they would pay no attention when I wanted to correct them. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own doings and be filled with their own devices. But then I find in another portion of scripture where sin is taking somebody for a ride. And so Paul goes and he tells us, so I am not the one doing the wrong, but it is sin that is living in me. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyways. But if I do what I don't want to, I am not the one that's really doing it. But it is sin living inside of me that does it. All sin needed was a vehicle. All sin needed was something just to carry it along. And it would cause that person to believe I am a part of you. Then sin would consummate its purposes of death. But why do you think repentance is necessary? Because your repentance says, you know what, sin? I ain't going to put up with your mess anymore. I ain't going to let you take me for a ride. But I'm going to take you for a ride. And I'm going to tell you, get up out of here. what happened with my time. And God said, unless they deal with it, unless they get their minds changed, they will die. It could not be hid in church attendance. It could not be hid in the many songs of the choir. It could not be hid in their being ushers. It could not be hid in anything of that sort. But God wanted them to deal with it. Because even when the righteous sin, unless they deal with their sins, and they will die in it. All his righteousness that he had done shall not be mentioned. God was not quick to rid them, just like he was not quick to rid us when we were in sin. And God was not quick to rid them when they stuck their toe, just like he ain't quick to rid us when we stub our toe. But God wanted repentance. That's why in the scriptures it tells us, return ye, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. I understand this may not be for everyone, but I did not come to preach to everyone, but I came to preach to the one. Or when people go and check themselves into a rehab, why do they go? <coughs> they go to get well. And part of that is them going to the doctor and acknowledging, I got something wrong with me. I need to be fixed. And so Jesus would go on and say, They that 
and behold, leave out of position. Anybody could go on and fool themselves that there's nothing wrong with them. But Jesus would go and say, but they that are sick, for I have not come to call the righteous or those that, that think there's nothing wrong with them, but I have come to call sinners to repentance. And then the verse of the scriptures tell us uh, that the Lord is close to those uh, who are of a broken heart, and such as are crushed with the sorrow of sin, and are humbly and thoroughly penitent, because those are the ones uh, that say, you know what, I realize and I acknowledge that within me there is something wrong, and because there is something wrong, uh, I want something to be done about it, God. God, would you go and enter into my life, uh, and God, like you did in the temple, begin to whip out things and begin to change Is this okay? Am I all right? This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Consider Saul, who beyond measure persecuted the church, was labeled as a blasphemer, or even labeled himself as a blasphemer. He would kick that people and throw them into Christian and then consent to the deaths of Christians. This guy was the original Antichrist. Not, not, you understand what I'm saying. He had the original spirit of an Antichrist in him. But God would use Paul as an example and as a testimony to us uh, that he could save even the worst of them that were willing to admit uh, God, I have a problem in my life. Uh, God, I need you to fix it. So, the psalmist would tell us, I thought of my ways. I got to pondering and I got to thinking about the things that, that I was doing. And I turned my feet to thy testimonies. Leviticus 5, musicians, if you would just get ready to come up. Leviticus 5 told us that when one realized that he committed sin, the first thing he was to do to deal with it was to cast it forth or to confess it. That word confess it meant to cast it forth the way that the, you know, the same way the body does when it goes and it ingests poison. It goes and it casts it forth in the form of vomit. And the scripture tells us that people who conceal their sins shall not prosper, they shall not move forward. But if they confess them, if they cast it forward, and they turn from them, they will receive mercy. That is a guarantee for the one that comes up today. And that says, you know what? I have an issue in my life. Then God says, I will give to you mercy. Casting it forward, not just walking away from it, but your mind and your hearts say to it, I see it as wrong. I see it as vile. I see it as foul. I see sin as deadly. And that right there would merit the mercy of God. Because if you don't see sin as wrong, it makes it easier for you to go back to it. Right. In judgment, a decision is made. But with mercy, God allows the space and the time for the mind to change. And because your mind changes towards sin, God says, I will change my mind in judgment towards you. The death that I have ahead of you, I will change it and I will give you life. And it came to pass on the other Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and he taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. And so, his right hand was withered like a leaf. And he learned to live with it. And he learned to function with that shriveled up, dried up left hand. He would probably attend to his duties of life with only the function of that left hand. He learned to do everything about without it. He learned to do everything with his left hand. And so he'd probably attend synagogue, sing songs. Maybe he was an usher. Maybe after church or after uh, synagogue, they'd go have fellowship. But he learned to do everything with only his left hand. His 
right hand symbolized spirit, but his left hand symbolized flesh. And because his left hand or his right hand cried and shriveled up, he gradually shifted over to that man of sin. He didn't have to think about it, but it was just in him to do it. And now he has become settled then. But now he is confronted by Jesus, who is aware of this condition. He could probably go into the place and he could hide it from others. He could probably conceal it but not move forward. But he couldn't do it from Jesus. For Jesus called him out on him. And Jesus said, hey, you, go stand over there. I don't know, just picture with me in your mind. Maybe he had it tucked away in his robe. Nobody knew about that dried up spiritual condition. And when Jesus told him to go stand over there, he didn't have to go stand over there. But because he went, he stood over there. He did it in obedience to the master. And when Jesus told him to stretch forth your hand, which was in other words, cast that thing forth, he could have stuck out his left hand, but he stuck out his right hand and he acknowledged the fact that God, there is something wrong with me. Jesus is not going to cast aside the one that is willing to admit, I have a problem in my life. As a matter of fact, this I have found in my own life, that Jesus would rather have you fight and rather have you struggle and rather have you overcome with sin than for you to be settled in. that I preached to everybody. But I do know this, that God intended this word for somebody. And you might could hide it from me. You might could hide it from anyone. You could even fool your own self. But you can hide it from Jesus. But what Jesus is saying is if you come down to the salt and you come and you lay that thing before me and say, sin, I ain't going to let you ravage me anymore. I will do something about it. I will deal with it. His blood was shed for our sin. To atone for our sin. To cover it up, to create a bridge that once one of the of the word. But God wouldn't turn to them. God would turn to the man that would beat his breast and say, God, I am a sinner. God, would you fix something in me? God, would you work in me? God, would you deal with this issue of sin in my life? Because I know that within myself, I cannot do anything about it. But I know that if I go and I take it to you, I can do something about it. My friend, oh wait a second, it wasn't just the Pharisees that Jesus would go and say, you know, he didn't do, not include Nicodemus. He saw something inside of Nicodemus. Nicodemus said, God, perhaps, I would imagine Nicodemus could be a righteous. But that's why Jesus would go on then to say, you must be born again of the water and of the spirit. Spirit will help me live because it leads to life and peace. Me being born of the water will cover up those things that are behind me that I think that are behind me. Brother Abel, let me think about it. Think about this. When those guys, they sat there and they listened to Peter preach. What happened to them? 
the hearts became print. Because their hearts became pricked, he said to them, What shall we do? What must we do? What can we do to right the wrong? How can we go and rid this thing that we have done in our lives? Holy Ghost is moving right now. Somebody get to pray. Actually, I need several people get to pray right now. Somebody get to pray right now. The Spirit is moving in this place right now. And God goes and He says, I will extend my mercy to you. Just like He extended it to those guys that said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then God would use mercy. And God would, would help Peter to say,